Underwriting for Auto Line this week has been provided by. In this epic battle of fuel efficiency and endurance, we're here to see which hybrid has the best MPG. That's the essence of a hybrid soul. But is there more to it? The Hybrid Game MPG Challenge. And now, here is your host, John McElroy. Want to welcome you all to AutoLine this week, where the discussion's all about connected cars and a little bit of autonomy, too. And to get into that discussion, I've got three experts in the field. Steve Surhai is with CompuWare. Richard Wallace is with the Center for Automotive Research in Ann Arbor. And Nick Cohn is with TomTom. And great to have you all here. Why don't I start with you, Richard? When people say connected car, what does that mean? It depends on who says it. <laughs> um, you know, two flavors really, and, and there's probably more, but, but two, two main ones. And one is sort of led by the USDOT program focused on safety, and that uses dedicated short range communications, which is sort of a Wi Fi type thing that operates at 5.9 gigahertz. It's for vehicle to vehicle, vehicle to infrastructure, intersection safety type applications, hardcore cooperative active safety. And then there's kind of everything else, which probably operates via. LTE, cellular, uh, either embedded, brought in, or otherwise. And there are some tweaks, too. You could, you could be working on a real Wi-Fi or a Bluetooth or other things. But those are the two main flavors. So it's information in and out of the car of various sorts. Steve, what's the consumer going to see in all this? What's the benefit of this technology? So a big component of, of what Richard's talking about is, is in the head unit in the vehicle or what people traditionally think of as the nav system or the radio as it evolves and it gets connectivity to the internet in the vehicle, all of a sudden you're able to not only stream music and get your live updates to your, your navigation components, but also to start bringing in other components and whether it be parking spot finders and or uh, other useful tools to the vehicle, combining it with the data that's coming in from the vehicle to vehicle and vehicle infra infrastructure components, all of a sudden the driver has access to much more data about what's going on in and around his vehicle while he travels down the road. Of course, Nick, one of the big complaints is that we're being inundated with information. How do we get all this information Steve just mentioned and, and uh, Richard as well in a way that the, the driver is not going to put him or herself in peril by trying to read all this stuff? Well, that's right. I mean, the, the, it's got to be a good user interface. It's got to basically follow the priorities of the driver what's really important, what's essential, and make it just easy and simple, one click away to a new route, you know, to avoid traffic, or one click to search for a hotel or restaurant and navigate to it. And uh, we, we spent a lot of time, as do others, working on that interface. Actually, the whole driving experience should be safer because of these systems as opposed to more complicated. Mm -hmm. Richard, you, you mentioned there's this big uh, DOT-sponsored uh, Experiment, I guess is the right way to say it, in Ann Arbor, Michigan. You've been following this closely. What are some of the issues that all the different entities are dealing with, and uh, what are some of the solutions coming out of it? Yeah, so the USDOT has funded a, a fairly large pilot demonstration on, on focused on the V2V safety side, and it's in Ann Arbor, and they have close to 3,000 vehicles equipped with different levels of functionality of, of a DSRC radio. And they're testing a variety of safety applications like electronic brake lights. So you can know that the vehicle six ahead of you has suddenly hit the brake. You don't have to wait for that red light cascade to reach the vehicle right in front of you. Adding to safety, you can start slowing down before the last car comes in, for example. That data from that test, how well is the system working? And they're testing various things like the maker of this radio box and the maker of this radio box, well, these two radios have to work together and with the third one and the fourth one because GM's going to buy from one vendor and maybe Toyota from a different one and so on and so forth. Some of them might be aftermarket because our cars today don't have these radios, but we may want one in the future. And do they all interoperate? That's a key area here. Do the right messages come out? How far do the messages broadcast? And they're finding actually that they broadcast a bit further than they thought, uh, which is interesting. Uh, they, they hope to test intersection safety, the light telling you, I'm going to change to red in five, four, three, two, one. And you can use that for safety. You can use that for powertrain management. Why am I accelerating if the light's going to turn 
read before I get there, that kind of thing. And uh, the whole cybersecurity uh, side, making sure no one's hacking into this, putting out malicious messages. Those are some of the big ones. User acceptance, you can run the gamut, but they were scheduled to end at the end of August, and in fact, they're going to extend the testing period until March, uh, get a little more data. And then the big news, John, of course, and I think you know this, is the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration is going to be taking these results and using it as one input amongst others to determine what it wants to do in terms of regulation of vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle safety. Is this something they might want to mandate, or is it something they want to see on a voluntary basis? Steve, it's, it's interesting what Richard's saying there is all these different companies getting together, trying to figure out a standard so all this communication can happen from different vendors. CompuWare is a software company, right? How, how did you guys get involved in this and what's your involvement in it? So you're right. CompuWare is a software company historically more focused on the information technology side of it. But in reality, there is so much software that now exists in the vehicle with all the different control units. And so we've really evolved to not only doing the IT side and, and what traditionally would be thought of as that software, but also all the software that resides in the car. So as you mentioned, we really position ourselves as a systems integrator around the different technologies, the different components, and all of the OEMs are challenged to uh, make all the different components work together. And there's somewhat limited standardization right now across the industry, and so there's a tremendous opportunity for us as an organization to pursue that in terms of helping the OEMs out. Oh, I don't want to get back into it because it sounds like there's real opportunity for business growth and potentially, hopefully, jobs in all this as well. Yes, absolutely. And I, I think that the comments that Governor Schneider made earlier today, uh, you know, it, it is an opportunity for the state of Michigan, really, to, and the region, to really emphasize the investment that we've all already made in this region around these technologies and to continue to leverage that and, and really launch it to a, a whole new aspect of, of automotive development. Nick, TomTom, Tom, of course, is worldwide famous for making these cool little portable navigation devices. You can put it in your car. If people haven't heard of TomTom, Tom, Garmin is another competitor of yours. But as a maker of navigation systems, what does TomTom Tom see in terms of all this connected car uh, new business that's coming up? Well, I think we've seen a real evolution, and it's going faster and faster. We, we've been providing, actually, what we call connected services, essentially providing drivers with aftermarket devices and now also smartphone apps with information about what's happening on the road right now so they can avoid delays, they can save mm -hmm. fuel costs, they can save aggravation, basically. Um, and what, what we see happening is that as we work, especially with OEMs, we see the, the smartphone apps essentially either working together with what's happening on the, in, in, in Dash or um, complementing what's in Dash. Essentially, that's merging together. So all of this consumer-based uh, technology, easy-to-use services, interfaces, that's what drivers want, and they want to have a seamless experience. So they want to just be able to look on their phone, get in the car, and have all the same information, all their preferences, just be there, no fuss. And, and no distraction. And uh, so that, that is, that's one of the core things that we've been working on. Um, but that's, that evolution is just, it's there. So explain this to me in the sense that I, I know TomTom Tom now offers real-time traffic reports. So you set your, your destination, and if there's a big roadblock the normal way, your nav may take you out of the way, but it could also save you a whole bunch of time. How are you getting all that information? And if you're already able to do that, why do we need all this connected car experimentation going on? Well, maybe I'll start with the answer. We, we do that with connectivity. So all of our customers are all uh, helping each other with information about what speeds they're traveling where. Um, that helps us identify where the, the traffic jams are, and that helps us reroute people to save them time, and save them fuel, basically, save them frustration. Um, and that connectivity now, it's in aftermarket devices, it's on phones, it's more and more in Dash as well. Um, <clears throat> so that connectivity opens up a lot of opportunities. So not just for traffic information, but to make a more of a seamless driving trip. So combine it with um, real-time road closures, for example. We can detect them. We can say, this road is closed, 
just you've got to go around it. You don't want to be stuck in that. Um, but also changes in what's happening to the road network. Um, so you don't want to have a, a map update that's two years old. You want to have what happened? What is that bridge open today? That's that's so that's what we're 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 doing is is bringing that together. So all the different pieces of the trip, not just the traffic, but the map, but the the addresses, um, uh, any kind of destination. Um, that's all merged seamlessly together, and maybe other functions in the in the in the in the vehicle, like um, music or phone. That should all be um, easily mixed in to just one single interface, so that uh, it's not a hassle for the driver. Can I add to that? A yeah, little? I do. And the one piece that isn't in there that is important, like in the uh, testing going on in Ann Arbor, is of course the cooperative active safety component, though I would be not surprised if a company like TomTom Tom was interested in working with the DSRC device makers. So explain, what, what is DSRC? Dedicated short-range communications. So this is like a little That's Wi-Fi five, unit? Yeah, it's, it's not Wi-Fi exactly. It's 802.11p. Wi-Fi is 802.11a, b, g, and n. Told you you'd learn something about this technology. <laughs> <laughs> and... Um, it's what drives the vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle safety and the intersection safety apps. It's very fast. It, it allows those, you know, sub-second, way sub-second reactions for the vehicle to break when you're reacting too slowly as, as the driver. And um, if, if NHTSA, as I talked about earlier, goes ahead with a, with a mandate process, a regulatory process to have that, we're going to really need a, a, a way to access aftermarket devices that will bring that in so that those of us with, uh, you know, cars that already exist today, which is, you know, 220 million or so of them, and the average age of the fleet is like 11.4 years, so it's going to take a while to get those new cars out there. Uh, a company like TomTom Tom working with a Savari or a Denso or others that make DSRC, that becomes that aftermarket device that allows you to play ball with the new cars that are coming down the road. Well, next we have done that. We did do a project with uh, Coda. Um, Another company that makes so the radios, yep. To, to make an aftermarket navigation system that could communicate by way of DSSRC. So we did. Great. Th I would say there, there is another angle to the safety, the whole safety issue and in terms of um, what we and, and, and our competitors are doing. So on the one hand, um, some studies have shown that people driving with navigation are actually calmer. So they're having fewer accidents. Um, but Explain that. How, can possi how possibly can people be calmer just because they have a navigation system in Well, I think one is less anxiety about um, finding an, a certain address or being lost or looking out the window sideways looking for at, at the house numbers. Um, part of it is anxiety about am I going to be on time. Um, turning left where you're not allowed to turn left. Um, these, are, these are dangerous things that can happen that can be avoided. Um, but it, there's some indefinable uh, idea that I have a system that's going to help me get to my destination the best way possible. I'm just going to follow that. I'm not going to fuss. And I, I think that's, that's an important factor. Um, the but we, zen of driving. Exactly. <laughs> it's relax. It's taking care of you. And that, that's essential. I like that. Um, so it, it, it influences people's driving style. But there's another way of providing um, safety warnings as well. For, for example, we're coming out with uh, essentially a warning that tells you you may not be able to see it, but there's the back end of a traffic jam in front of you. Mm -hmm. So to warn people so they're not slamming out their brakes too late right. the, and hitting the back of a of traffic jam. So that's something that we'll be introducing this year. Um, so there are a number, and that's also by way of connectivity. So it's not talking to the traffic lights, yep. but it is essentially indirectly speaking to the other vehicles. It's using probe data. Yes. It is, yeah. it is. So, so there are other aspects of safety that are certainly central to what we're doing, Absolutely. even though we're not doing it that no, way right I, now. No, definitely. There's, there's all sorts of safety applications that are not hardcore cooperative active safety. Even um, a recent conversation I had with one of the providers of usage-based insurance, the sort of pay-as-you-go insurance, I said, we provide a report back to our customers. You know, you had N hard-breaking incidents last month. You did this, you did that. And they find over time, they watch those numbers go down. So people actually with little more than just, hey, you did this too often, you might lighten up a little bit. They find those drivers become better drivers. Same, similar to what you were talking yeah. about. And I think that's another part of connectivity. Um, 
making drivers aware of what, what of all the vehicle information that's actually there, but in a packaged, usable way, Absolutely. and not while they're driving, but after the fact. Um, <laughs> not distracting them. But, and you can imagine for businesses, showing them how they could save fuel. I mean, some, some, some delivery businesses, you can imagine what proportion of their total business cost that is. And if you can tell them you could save fuel if you avoided traffic jams, idled less, or if you change your driving style, that's huge. That's, that's happening. Yeah, that drops right to the bottom line, no yeah. question about it. Uh, Steve, Richard raised a good point. Hacking into the system, that's a big mm -hmm. fear right now. You're bringing in all this information to the car. The hackers are going to try to get in there as well. It's got to be an issue that you're looking at at CompuWare. Yeah, and it's, it, there was recently a video that was launched. Um, there were two gentlemen. It was launched at DEF CON. Uh, earlier this year and they basically show how they get in and they they got into the bus of the vehicle and they started flooding it with false messages and they were able to take over the steering they were able to take over the brake braking and some other components on the vehicle and in essence you know just watching the vehicle raised everybody's antenna and I think with with the way vehicles are structured right now it, it's it's I'll say tough to do probably not impossible to do because there's limited over-the-air updates to the software itself. Um, but certainly, as the industry moves forward, one of the key advantages to all OEMs and suppliers is the ability to reflash any of the control units in the vehicle uh, once the vehicle's left the dealer lot. Historically, you would be required to come into the dealer to have a upgrade to your one of your control modules, and, and they might just do nothing more than stick a USB into some port in the vehicle and it would reflash that particular controller. In the future, you'll be able to do that through uh, 4G LTE or some other type of uh, connectivity to the vehicle. It certainly opens up Pandora's box as it relates to security. Um, and there's, uh, you know, everybody's working with different encryption components and all uh, certificate issuance and all the other different security topics to make sure that that bus is secure within the vehicle and, and actually building firewalls into certain components in the vehicle to make sure that uh, it's not able to cross into areas that could, could potentially be safety hazards. Richard, is this something that uh, keeps the, the connected car community awake at night, this, this ability for hackers to get into a car and control it? I, I don't think so. It's important. It's critical in, in the ways that Steve just laid out. You know, you wouldn't want malicious messages coming in and you know, making the car break when it was dangerous to do so and the driver was not controlling it and, and this and that. And it is being tested some in the safety pilot that's on their agenda. I know they've tried some distinct events where they try to get a malicious message into the car and did the security system prevent it. And from what I've heard so far, they've succeeded. It, what they've used in this test, uh, the software and such has worked. Um, so not keeping people awake at night, but definitely on the list of things that will have to be addressed in a very rigorous way if we're to move from uh, demonstrations and safety pilots to full-blown deployment. That's definitely one of the top three or so items that will have to be made sure works perfectly well. Yeah. Nick, how high up the priority list at TomTom Tom is this whole concept of uh, people being able to hack in? Well, it's, I would say our, our privacy, privacy protection is very high. People being able to actually hack into um, our individual aftermarket systems or even, even in dash connectivity that we might be involved in. Um, uh, there's a lot of work done on security. There has been from day one when we set up our systems and our data centers. Um, but I think it's more uh, the fact that all of our systems are engineered so that uh, there is no individual information or individual connection possible um, by anybody external and actually even internally it's pretty limited. So it's, it's high on the list uh, but more on the side of protection than um, specifically hacking. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right. Of course, the, uh, Steve, the, the cars that have been hacked into, as you mentioned, DEF CON, which yep. is the hacker conference, right, right. Uh, those were cars that were never hardened. Those were cars that were designed by engineers who never dreamed that somebody might try to hack into a car. So this is a very new problem. Well, and in reality, if you do watch the video, they literally have to remove the entire instrument cluster to figure out which controllers are in the vehicle and then 
I, I can't recall the exact time they said it took them to do it, but it was in excess I of six months. I thought it was like two hours at, l at least. Is it even longer, six months? It was, yeah, it, no, it was a considerable amount okay. of time for them to figure out exactly what the different protocols were of the different controllers and then how they were going to be able to get access to those controllers within the bus. So, and I, I believe that um, they literally, they were plugged into one of the ports in the vehicle to be sending the messages. So it wasn't an over-the-air hack. Right, because there was somebody in the back seat uh, tapping okay. on the yes. keyboard to, to make this Prius, in this yes. case, stop or turn uncontrollably, yes. or so it seemed. Yes. Uh, okay, good. So you make me feel a whole lot better. This is, yeah, hacking into a car isn't going to be as easy as maybe it's Well, especially made. at 70 miles an hour. <laughs> <laughs> Richard, so run through what some of the benefits, again, are going to be. I, I mean, we're, we're talking about saving time and, and possibly being safer. Crash but avoidance is probably number one. Uh, USDOT has estimated that at least the DSRC-type connected vehicle, that flavor, can address roughly 80% of non-impaired driver crash scenarios. Um, that's why it moved to the top of their list, why V2V was ahead of V2I in sort of their field testing. Um, mobility and, and route guidance and real time, which we've talked about already here at some length, saving you time and fuel and so on and so forth. But there's also the whole area of what I would call personal convenience. So, you know, you're on a trip and, and, and you need to get gas. Well, you can get, well, the cheapest gas in the next 30 miles and is at this station, two exits, up, uh, location-based services, it's called. So I would, I would put a, a lot of uh, emphasis on that. It's probably not one that drives through the DSRC channel. Probably comes through LTE, LTE Advanced, coming down the pipeline. Might be embedded. It might be on a broad-in device. It could be on a broad-in device that's linked to the, yeah. <laughs> to the embedded <laughs> devices. So there's various flavors out there. Today, John, and one thing that came up earlier, and I wanted to jump in and didn't get a chance, I think another thing that hits the consumer is I get all these bills, and I think they don't like that. So yeah. if we can drive that all into one yeah. sort of package that I get with my provider, and I don't really worry about whether it came directly to the car, it came directly to my tablet or phone, I just know I'm paying for some packet of data, that's probably a more consumer-friendly approach. That's a great point, Richard. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure, you know, we're all inundated. You know, we got to pay for our phone and our cable yeah. and our internet. Now, now there's going to be another bill on top of that. How how do you plan to handle it? Well, it's it's one of the reasons for our aftermarket devices. We've started introducing just everything's included lifetime of the aftermarket device. So, map updates, real time traffic. As long as it's going, it's you have it, and there's no yeah. bill. I've noted um, even the even the OEMs with their embedded telematics are moving more towards you get it for a long time. Right, not so we work with them on the same yeah. basis because nobody wants to, to, to deal with uh, three different bills. So, right. uh, yeah. um, and it's also the perception. You know, I think I think many consumers are willing to even pay a little bit more up front if they never have to think about it again. So um, I think that's all. It's merging just as the, mm -hmm. the different streams of technology and, and, and services and, and, and software are merging together. So is the, the CRM or the, the billing slides. Yes. They, because it's about a seamless driving experience, mm -hmm. and that's included, including not getting an email that you've got to you know, pay something to use, your, <laughs> use some service in your, in your vehicle. That would be a distractor right Absolutely. there. <laughs> and there are other content providers that are looking at other ways to monetize that, and whether it be through new forms of advertising in the vehicle and or taking data from the vehicle and somehow monetizing the data on the back end. And, and I know there are different business models that are out there that um, have yet to really play out in reality, but you, you know, even the notion of being able to offer Starbucks coupons as you're passing by a Starbucks, things of that nature in the vehicle and then have them tie into a mobile device and or other components that will then allow you to walk in and, and redeem your coupon. Richard, yeah. and so as I uh, talked about at the very beginning of the show, this would seem to open up all kinds of business opportunities and more employment. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it probably wasn't lost on any of us sitting here, but you probably saw the announcement last week that the old Willow Run plant that's been sitting vacant and trying to figure out what to, to repurpose that as is, is, is a group out of Ann Arbor and a large developer uh, said, We're, we plan to clean that site up and, and get it ready for putting in a connected vehicle 
testing center and automated vehicle testing center as well, where these companies can all come together and the small ones can grow and the big ones can get the new IP they need. And it's pretty exciting and tied to the location where the safety pilots have been. It probably makes a lot of sense, not far from the traditional automotive industry, not far from a lot of the research labs in, in the area. It, it, you know, it's got ways to go, but it makes a lot of sense. So how does it, can I ask, how does that fit in um, with the, the timing of, of all the functionality and technology that's being tested in the safety pilot, how that gets into um, everyday production stream? What, what phases? Is there a phase that's after that that needs to be tested? Or is, do a lot of the OEMs already have some of that functionality that's being tested now? We need Ann a Arbor? super quick answer. We're down to the Yeah, very it, end. it's kind of both. The OEMs are testing this on their own uh, sites, obviously, but a place where we know that we can certify this device works, this device works with this other one, so this company can talk to that one. And it really builds post safety pilot, uh, builds the industry as opposed to testing that it works. It's really two different things. Well, good. On that note, we're going to have to hang it up right here. Great discussion. There's a lot more to learn. Steve Surhai from CompuWare, Richard Wallace from the Center for Automotive Research, Nick Cohn from TomTom. Tom. Thank you very much. And I want to thank you for having tuned in. Underwriting for Auto Line this week has been provided by. In this epic battle of fuel efficiency and endurance, we're here to see which hybrid has the best MPG. That's the essence of a hybrid soul. But is there more to it? The Hybrid Game MPG Challenge.